Good, good evening and uh, welcome to the second of Mary Grother's Rosenbach lectures. We have a treat in store. Um, so I am here, I'm Peter Stalibras. I'm here for an endless series of introductions. You know, the introducer, the introducer, the introducer. I am not here to introduce Mary Carruthers. I'm here to introduce Roger Chartier, who is going to introduce uh, Mary Carruthers. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you could just, you know. <laughs> uh, my pleasurable task this evening is to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Roger Chartier, who will introduce Mary Carruthers. Uh, Roger is professor at the Collège de France in Paris an Annenberg Professor of History here at Penn. When I think of the recent emergence of the history, book, or history of the book as an international discipline, uh, I think above all of three people, a New Zealand bibliographer, Don Mackenzie, uh, a French, histor a French historian, uh, Roger Chartier, uh, and an Italian paleographer, Armando Petrucci. It is an honor to have Roger here at Penn, where he delivered the Rosenbach Lectures in 19... When was it? 19, 94. In 1994. Uh, tonight, he will introduce Mary Carruthers. So welcome to Roger. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> in uh, Christopher Marlowe's The Massacre at Paris, Petrus Ramus, or in French, Pierre de la Ramée, is assassinated during the Saint Barthélemy by the Duke of Anjou, the brother of the king, who stabs himself, who stabs to death the professor of logic at the Collège Royal. <laughs> the Duke of Guise, who leads the Catholic murderers, accuses Petrus Ramus not for being a Protestant, but because he has said that Aristotle's organon was a heap of vanities, and because he considers as a learned man, he that will be a flat dichotomist. The expression referred to Ramus' universal logic that proceeds by distinction, distribution, disposition of topics in branching diagrams. As indicated by Jan Blair, another Rosenbach lecturer, if such a method was often attached to Ramus' name, it was largely used as a conceptual guide, finding device or outline for an argument before him and independently of his influence. And for example, in Theodor Zwinger, Theatrum Vitae Humanae. And Blair adds, medieval manuscripts also experimented with branching diagrams. It is experimentation that is the topic of Marie Carruthers' 2017 Rosenbach Lecture. And it is for me a great honor and pleasure to introduce her for this second lecture. My task was made easier by the superb introduction given yesterday by Rita Copland. So I just would like to emphasize why Marie Carruthers' work was and is so important for all historians and not only the medievalists. The reason is given by the central thesis of her book, the book of memory. I quote her, it is my contention that medieval culture was fundamentally memorial to the same profound degree that modern culture in the West is documentary. This distinction always Marika Reuters speaking. This distinction certainly involves technologies, mnemotechniques and printing, but it is not confined to them. For the valuing of memoria persisted long after book technology itself has changed. That is why the fact of books in themselves, which were much more available in the late Middle Ages, Middle Ages than ever before, did not profoundly disturb the essential value of memory, of memory training, until many centuries has passed." End of quote. Marie Carotta's affirmation was, and still is, a strong challenge launched to book historians, either those who, after Fevre and Martin, or Elizabeth Eisenstein, consider the invention of the printing press as a revolution, or those who, following Armando Petrucci 
of Franco Alessio emphasized the profound mutation of the written culture when in the 12th century, the monastic practice of the scrivere senza leggere is replaced by the scholastic culture of the scrivere per leggere. Marie Caruto's provocative thesis was not limited to this first reappraisal. She challenged also the perspective developed by Jacques Goody that attributes to writing the possibility of modes of thought and cognitive operation impossible without graphic inscription on clay, wax, parchment, or paper. Marie Caruthers does not accept such a view. I quote her, the symbolic representations that we call writing are no more than the cues or triggers for the memorial representations, also symbolic, upon which human cognition is based. And she added, and to mistake one sort of thing for the other would be a significant error. Writing something down cannot change in any significant way our mental representation of it, for it is a mental representation that gives birth to the written form, not vice versa." End of quote. Whence the importance of the topic she has chosen for this lecture using diagrams in the Middle Ages. Diagrams are indeed graphic devices and written disposition of topics inscribed on the pages of the codices. How must we consider them? Did they indicate with other reference tools, indexes, concordances, tables, a first distance taken vis-a-vis -vis the mnemonic architectural method and the first step in the transfer to book and today computers of memorial materials and operation? Or were they an adaptation of mnemotechnics still central in medieval ethical and intellectual life to a more an adaptation to a more bookish culture, as Marie Caruta suggested when she wrote, I quote, the development of tabular layouts and the advice to use them mnemonically went hand in hand. Since there is a clear, persistent theme in all medieval mnemonic advice to take advantage of the presentation of the physical page as fixative for memory. Yesterday, in a brilliant lecture, Marie Carutas began to frame her answer to this question. Today, she will introduce us to three fundamental diagrammatic forms, or as she said, shapes of creativity, the trees, the tower, the building. We shall listen to her with a dichotomous passion, remembering in the table of our memory, unfortunate Ramos. Please welcome with me Marie Carutas. Thank you very much, Roger. I shall not forget it. Poor Ramos. <laughs> As I begin this second lecture on cognitive geometries, it seems to me that a brief review of just what the topics that are, we are so, to be so concerned with in this series were considered to be. Yesterday, I was primarily focused on geometry, and now it is time to consider topics. The standard definition from the time of Aristotle on was that they are the seats or places of arguments, sedes or loci argumentorum. The formulations are equally common, and of course the one sedes uh, is a literal translation of the Greek topos. And the other, locus, is the equivalent uh, synonym in, in Latin as well. But just what was meant by speaking in such terms in what sense are topics seats? And what is it that sits in each seat? A very great deal has been written 
and I'm just going to give you some titles here, by historians of both logic and rhetoric on the subject. And here are a few helpful titles. They are also incidentally on, or not so incidentally, on the bibliography of suggested readings, uh, a bunch of which are at the back of the room, if you didn't get one yesterday. Uh, also back there are the uh, readings for the first lecture, if you didn't get one, uh, and I would uh, hope that you would pick them up because some, there's some overlap uh, with today's talk. The ancient works best known to most medieval writers were by Cicero, who around 55 BC wrote on the topics in response partly to the eponymous work by Aristotle, Peri Topoi, and partly to Stoic developments in Greco-Roman rhetorical teaching on the subject of invention, or as we now call it, composition. Cicero's Topica, in turn, was commented on and developed further in the early 5th century, 6th century, by Boethius, and it is mainly Boethius's works on the subject that provided the immediate foundation for what medieval writers such as Hugh of St. Victor said on the subject, though Cicero's Topica itself was also known. And especially after the late 11th century, Aristotle's work, too, was studied directly in Latin translations. But that's one reason why Boethius dominates this particular list. This is the first of the quotations that you have. Uh, in Topica, Cicero defined the seats as follows. And I've given you in red certain words that I think are particularly important, as I'll come to in a minute. As the discovery of matters that are hidden away is made easy by means of a known and marked location, just so if we wish to track down some argument, we must know the places, for they were so named by Aristotle as seats, as it were, from which arguments are drawn forth. Accordingly, we may define a locus as the seat of an argument. A topic was understood more broadly then than we might do now, as indeed was what constituted an argument. Arguments included examples, maxims, stories, even omens and miracles. Indeed, the complete contents of the florilegial collections of dicta et facta memorabilia that formed a core of ancient and medieval learning, and of course we search to find these online now. Anything that might be persuasive to a particular group on a particular occasion was called an argument. Cicero famously brought a wounded general into court, weeping over his displayed scars through the court. That, too, is an argument. Other topics are still familiar to us. For example, who, what, where, when, why, and how these fundamental analytical questions were called the circumstantiae because they stood around at the topic, and of course they still are the circumstances. And topics which serve to cue and originate invention also could be particular words and phrases in addition to these analytical categories. Phrases like justice, piety, love, and so on. Each such topic seat can serve as the core of a sermon or meditation or other composition, or topics can, of course, be combined. But the main advantage of using such structures is that you will thereby know where you are in your various topics and can mentally go there directly and securely without fumbling around and repeating yourself and getting lost. You also need to take pains that each seat should be amply stored with chains of arguments that you can call forth as you choose and invoke, adapt, and elaborate as you judge appropriate to your occasion. You will no longer be limited, if you ever were, to speaking your fully prepared speech solely by rote. I've written extensively about the cognitive efficacy of modeling inventive thinking in this way, and I touched on it yesterday. But I stress to you once more that the practice, for it is a practice, it's a techne. You can't just read about it in some book. This practice embodies the recognition 
that memory and remembering are the foundation of all invention. The matters one seeks in one's mind are thought of as covered over, as Cicero wrote, abscondite, in that quote, an idea synonymous with the common Latin word for forgotten, which is oblitus, literally smeared over and thus hidden from view. To find an argument, one has first to investigate its tracks and traces, rather as one must do to find a rabbit hidden in its burrow, as this delightful painting in the bottom margin of a 13th century English Psalter illustrates. The image recalls what one needs to do in order to meditate upon the Psalms. Rabbits, as you know, are notably fertile creatures. So when discovered or uncovered, the event's essential task of invention, each one can generate much new food for our minds to chew over. Recall Augustine's remark in De Trinitate, book 11, which if you haven't read should be on your immediate book list, um, that by such recollective searching through one's conceptualized experiences, one can not only understand things that one has never actually experienced, but also things that cannot exist in nature. And in this way, the topics will serve indeed as sources and origins of what we cognize and the things that we say. This model of human invention underlies all medieval understanding of how human beings think and understand their ideas, even about God. Mens memoria est, mind is memory. It is a medieval as well as ancient commonplace. And it's also crucial to grasp that a location is always discovered relative to other locations. In other words, location is not an absolute quality of the thing itself. This means that the content linked to an argument may very well have many places and not just be found in one place and in one location and one way. One other matter about the medieval understanding of the topics is important to keep in mind. Roman and medieval teaching, including in Cicero, distinguished two technical practices which had different goals, but both of which involved the topics. You can best think of them as two functions of a basic analytical technique. As Boethius says in his discussion of topics, and he's citing Cicero in doing this, quote, orderly reasoning has two tasks, judging and inventing. The former, Cicero says, citing Stoic ideas, is more formal, involving the propositional relationships necessary when judging things to be necessarily true and false, what we now think of as formal syllogism. It's taught in dialectic. And the other task, inventing, also involves the method of topics, but its goal is persuasion, and its arguments are more often, as Cicero says, ad usu according to custom. Arguments drawn from social customs, cultures, traditions, and mores, or conventions. Those are that kind of argument. It is taught primarily as an aspect of rhetoric. And remember that in the classical trivium, dialectic was considered usually before rhetoric. So there are two goals using the same art, ars judicandi and ars inveniendi. And both use the essentially rememorative methods and techniques of locating what one learns. You can think of the method of topics as a navigational tool for your mind, an essential way for rediscovering what you once learned but has now become covered over, like that rabbit, obscured to your mental sight. Take, for example, this common diagram of Boethian topical logic called the square of opposition. As I said, it's a diagram deriving from Aristotle's own interpretation and was included regularly in the Organon. The iconography is probably Roman, uh, but was used by Boethius, and Boethius is one of the main transmission channels uh, in the Middle Ages. Now, we look at this diagram, and all we see is a static hierarchical relationship among binaries. And that's how it's usually taught. Uh, 
I'll just let you look at this one for a bit. <laughs> Not all medieval students saw this as static as we do. This is a 14th century student livening up his version of the square in the margin of a manuscript of Organon, that basic collection of texts in dialectic. We can't now even date the doodle, let alone what was in its maker's mind, but drawing it as the shield of an armored knight, uh, notice, of course, these chainmail leggings that you see in the bottom here as he doodles along. And also, of course, the helmet, uh, which he seems, it's a little hard to see exactly. It looks like a pot. <laughs> um, this part of the drawing certainly accords with the notion of dialectic as a closed fist and debate as combat. And I refer you here to the quotation I give you from Cassiodorus on the relationship of rhetoric and dialectics, number B3 in the handout for the first uh, lecture. Uh, that's the famous one about dialectic as the closed fist and rhetoric as the open hand. Okay, so the closed fist, debate as a combat, and yet the shield, as you see, also has grown a great many flowers. Uh, and this long leafy branch that's coming out, actually is a tree almost, uh, from its top up here. Uh, there we go. It goes on quite for some time. Um, perhaps because out of dialectic rhetoric produces flowers of eloquence, or perhaps because complicated ideas will blossom from arguments, uh, I don't know. Um, whatever was going on, he was letting his mind wander about between the lines, as it were, in the margins of the text that he was studying. Here's a more sober opposition. Uh, this, of course, uh, mid ninth century and here uh, in the Schoenberg collection. Uh, more sober opposition square drawn in the same location in the same Boethian logic text defining the topic of opposition. And here also the square is not conceived as simply static. Notice how the lower version of it on this page indicates the flow of premises across the diagonals as well as their more stable relationship uh, within the topic itself. Dialectic was often called in medieval Latin the via rationalis, the way of reasoning, and conceived of as a progress, a variety of mapped itinerary. One could not simply leap to conclusions. One of the things I hope you pick up from this is how much of this vocabulary is still absolutely fundamental uh, to the way in which we talk about these matters. I've often written about the rhetorical concept of ductus, the way in which a work guides you about and through itself. The basic model in medieval rhetoric for composition of any sort is that of a journey with a beginning, a destination, and many stops along the route, and it allows for side trips of the sort we find so often in all the medieval arts. The 12th century theorist, Geoffrey of Van Sof, in the updating of Horace that he named Poetry and Nova, likens composing to the craft of map making, as well as to the craft of building, uh, and also to that of conjuring. There is nothing static about this model of art. It involves its audience to move energetically within a work, not to view it from a cool distance as a finished product. This, I believe, is why medieval diagrams are so pictorial, as we now say, often to our minds overly so, almost to the point of concealing their subject matters. They seek to move us to some action as well as simply to instruct us. 
So I'd like now to move to consider what happens when several different shapes, several geometries, as I'm calling them, are applied to exactly the same subject matter. And I've picked diagrams of the liberal arts, or as this subject was more often called, the divisiones philosophiae, the divisions of philosophy or of human knowledge, scientia, as distinct from divinely revealed knowledge. At all times during the medieval millennium, mastery of these arts was considered essential to the proper understanding of the Bible and of theology. I've mentioned the importance of via and ductus, so I'll start there. And I'm just going to describe a text to you. It's too long to, uh, to reproduce it here. In the early 12th century, a canon named Honorius Augusto Studenensis, um, he used to be called Honorius of Autun, uh, but he was certainly never in Autun, although he may have been attached to a church in Regensburg, which, as you know, is in Bavaria. Anyway, Honorius wrote a treatise De Artibus, On the Arts, in which he imagines the progress of a human soul from its exile in ignorance to its homeland, its patria, in wisdom, or sapientia. And he imagines it as an itinerary through seven cities, kibitates, he calls them, from Babylon to Jerusalem. He describes this also as a gradual journey from complete darkness, Babylon, to full light in Jerusalem. On this route, the first city is Grammar, where Donatus and Priscian are teaching. The gateway to this city is through three sorts of sounds, vowels, semivowels, and consonants. These lead in turn to the houses of sentences via the paths of syllables and then whole words, and finally on to the grand villas of the poetical works, the Libri Poetarum, including Lucan, Terence, Perseus, and Horace. And in this manner, the treatise proceeds. After leaving the city of grammar, one comes to the city of rhetoric, and this is where Cicero teaches, and thence to dialectic, which is a walled city encircled by nine towers in which Aristotle expounds his topics, then on to arithmetic, and thence to music. Both are cities in which Boethius is the sim simultaneously the only teacher. <laughs> And thence uh, to geometry, where with Aratus' aid, uh, a map, the world map, the map of Mundi, is explained, and thence on to astronomy. There are actually 10 artes in Honorius's route, something not unusual at all in 12th century schemes, the final three being physic, which for Honorius meant medicine, presided over by Hippocrates, mechanica, all, as he says, arts made with human hands, whether of metal or wood or marble, and what he calls economics. We would now call politics and law the proper ordering of the institutional households of church and state. Now, I've never seen Honorius's itinerary mapped as an actual drawing, but it is nonetheless evidently a diagram map and intended to be imagined as such from the text. <coughs> The productive third dimension, it seems to me at any rate, in any itinerary diagram is not altitude, but time. Indeed, I would argue that time is at least a potential dimension in any diagram that implies some movement, as indeed most of them do. You can see this most obviously in the circular diagrams of uh, the cosmos, which always show movements in time, but it does seem to me one sees them elsewhere. And here again, I showed you this briefly yesterday, is a painted woodcut of the arts, a printed woodcut of the arts, this time arranged as a household within a tower, built up solidly from the foundation of grammar. And again, I'll just let you look at it for a minute. Uh, as you see, the icons of the, of the teachers are all underneath their subjects. Uh, and it goes on into the chambers of physics and morals. This print is early 16th century, but the curriculum it models is still recognizably that of Honorius, even to some of the great teacher figures who sit as iconic mental keys to each room. Each scheme, itinerary, and house 
involves movement, but they're not the same movements. Honorius' itinerary is horizontal. One enters and passes through each city, although, of course, taking time to explore as each one as fully as one can. Uh, Honorius' journey uh, has many delays and several stopovers to see the sites, as you see. But the Margarita Philosophia uh, house is vertical as well as horizontal. So you have to go up the stairs at the bottom um, and enter the door. You've got the little pupil with his horn book at the side there. Uh, entering the door into grammar on the ground floor with Donatus in the lower chamber and Priscian in the upper. And then mounting up the big stairs to the first floor uh, circling through logic, rhetoric, and arithmetic, and then up to music, geometry, astronomy, up another flight to physic, which here means physics more in our sense of physics, uh, the essential truths of nature, and is the domain of the philosopher that is Aristotle, but Aristotle augmented by all the commentaries. Uh, so we've got physic on one side and morale on the other side, what we would call ethics, and is presided over by Seneca. And Theologia, or Metaphysica, is at the very top and is overseen, as you see, by Peter Lombard. But these exalted subjects all rest firmly on grammar. If that foundation were to collapse, the whole building falls. This architectural concept, I think, implies different movements from that of Honorius's itinerary in the same ways that vertical motion up, about, and through a solid geometric shape, one with length, width, and height, is different from horizontal movement along a geometric plane having length and width, but whose third dimension is always time. The image that I selected for the announcement of this Rosenbach series provides an excellent example of how a tower works. The Tower of Wisdom was a popular diagram, sometimes presented alone, but also as part of a much copied collection of diagrams now called Speculum Theologiae. The Tower of Wisdom was designed primarily for the use of preachers needing to compose sermons, a very great many sermons. For medieval preaching by the 13th century, when this diagram was first made, could be an all-day affair, something like preaching in the American revivalist traditions. And in monasteries of the earlier Middle Ages, the colloquy and refectory meditations were also lengthy affairs, meditational talks on scripture and monastic life. So rhetorical invention was a constant need. And as you see, this tower came with instructions for use. The phrases written into the various parts of the structure are all invention topics. So in the line of stones marked K, that's the first line of stones above the uh, first floor, the entry floor, we have amor, or love, and then be single-minded. I'm just going to give you an English translation. Fear God, love God, praise God, give thanks to God, spurn the world, honor the saints, celebrate the feast days, keep your conscience pure. And altogether, there are 120 <coughs> seats of argument in the stonework alone, each labeled with a moral topic capable of being expanded copiously by itself or in combination with other materials. And when you add in the topics of the columns, the windows, the ramparts, the stairs, you can appreciate how this one diagram served as a sermon-making machine, an all-in-one ars inveniendi for talkative and indeed argumentative friars. And others could use it as well in different contexts. The tower shape is a versatile tool, not, not limited to a particular subject matter. Notice also that the means of climbing within a tower like this one is stairs, the Latin word gradus or scala, which also, of course, mean a ladder. So when you read a medieval treatise that proceeds from one to the next gradus, or passus for that matter, or makes use of a scala, you should think of yourself as on a journey, which is following an itinerary upward or outward, or in all likelihood, in both directions at the same time, uh, as is true in this tower and indeed uh, in the Margarita Philosophia. And remember also, and this is very important, 
that stairs like ladders must be climbed one step at a time, starting from the bottom, and that each step depends on the preceding one. Again, the shape will guide how you get to go. A related geometry is apparent in the class of diagrams that designers call trees. And here are two very simple examples. Diagrams, again, of the liberal arts. The schematic on the left is Carolingian from the monastery of St. Emran, also in Regensburg, made around 820. And the one on the right, in a manuscript known as the Arnstein Bible, was drawn some 300 years later in a manuscript, in the 12th century, rather. And it's from a northwestern uh, German monastery of premonstratensian canons. Now, historians and graphic designers call these trees, and they are sketches sort of like trees. The locations that such trees provide have a main trunk with ramifications, and one can see that their relationships are organic in terms of origins and offsprings. Such trees can produce ideas as families produce children, and also trees grow incre incrementally and in rational directions. But a leafier, more natural-looking tree was envisioned in a poem by the Carolingian bishop Theodolf of Orléans about the same time as the St. Emran tree schematic was drawn. And Theodolf describes visualizing wholly in his mind, and this is uh, number F on the, uh, on the readings here. And I... No, nope, sorry. You have to read it. I'll read it to you as well. He describes visualizing entirely in his mind a great tree growing on the disk of the earth, and grammar sits in the roots, and a great number of leafy branches, each laden with fruits, rise up from her seat. Rhetoric and dialectic just above her, then the civic arts of logic and jurisprudence, together with the cardinal virtues, then the theoretical ones of physica, music, geometry, astronomy. And the verbal pictura, because that's what he calls this poem, uh, concludes in this way. And just, I'm just going to read you, as I said, the, uh, an English translation. This tree had these both leaves and hanging fruits, and in this way had a garment and offered many mysteries. Understand words in the leaves, meaning in the fruits, these increase with frequency, those nourish when well used. In this tree, our burgeoning life is trained and exercised, so that always from poor things it may seek more lofty ones. And human sense, bit by bit, may climb on high, though for a long time it may scorn this in order to follow inferior things. Okay. Now, Theodolf's tree contains many mysteries to be unraveled, the leaves are its words. The fruits are its multiple meanings. In summary, Theodolf writes, every student must climb the tree, discovering more complete knowledge as one does so. Sometimes the sort of tree diagram I showed you in the manuscripts from St. Emran and Arnstein are called upside-down tree schematics. The visionary tree in Theodolf's poem, however, grows upwards like a natural tree, bearing both leaves and fruits. And like a real tree, to be comprehended, it has to be climbed from the roots up the trunk, each leafy, fruitful branch supporting the others, and all supported by the roots where grammar dwells. Theodolf describes it elsewhere in the poem as a community of the arts, something I think like a monastery of various ever-expanding knowledge. And climbing the tree, he also says, is vigorous exercise. The audience is not supposed just to stand back and admire the view. And also, you better not just waste all your time with all that lower stuff. In a fine recent study, the art historian Andrea Vorm is focused on the development of the specifically genealogical tree form, best known to us through myriad examples of the tree of Jesse. She traces how a thoroughly schematic late antique diagram called the Tree of Consanguinity, used by Isidore of Seville, 
was gradually adapted to the purposes of Christian salvational history as the Jesse tree, a lot showing the genealogy of Christ, a diagram, of course, ubiquitous throughout later medieval Europe in manuscripts, murals, reliefs, and mosaics. And she convincingly shows how the very conception of this tree diagram shifts during this evolution. As she observes, quote, a tree provides a multi-layered metaphor, and by first associating the ancient tree of consanguinity with the tree of Eden, and thus with the history originating fall, the static concept of time and paradise, which indeed is entirely static, it's omnitemporal, changes to a progressive concept. And as a result, the visualization of time in a human dimension, the family relationships in the tree of consanguinity, and the progress of time in the divine plan complete and complement each other. The end quote. So a tree diagram, when fully fleshed out, and I mean that literally, well-rounded trunk, solid branches, leaves, and fruits, can incorporate, in fact, four dimensions, length, breadth, height, and time. Geometry is thus shown to grow from measuring the simple shapes of a Euclidean plane into measuring bodies that are in motion and thus in time into the branch of astronomy, which, of course, geometry is the uh, uh, basis for. I showed you this one yesterday a bit, too. Now, so here's another liberal arts diagram using a completely different shape. It is also of the Divisiones Philosophiae, but it's a circle. Actually, it's a circular building with a dome and an arcade, somewhat like the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem. We are located just above the top of the dome, looking down in a bird's eye perspective, like that we saw yesterday in the cubic architecture of the heavenly Jerusalem painted in the Apocalypse manuscripts. Only this time, the bird's eye is of a hemisphere. The movement this geometry implies is very different from that of a tree. There are no branches. There is no root or trunk, nothing to climb. Instead, the diagram implies what Martianus Capella has Lady Geometry say about spherical bodies, that a sphere, quote, containing all other figures within itself consists of circles into which it is resolved. And in this picture from the 12th century Hortus Deliciarum, philosophy's sphere resolves into the surrounding arcade that contains each particular liberal art and also contains them within her all-encompassing sphere. You will note, I hope, that unlike most of our modern university curricula, they are not isolated from one another, but form a wholly articulated and linked rotundity. And that, of course, is one of the chief features of the rotundity of the spherical form. There have been several efforts recently to categorize medieval diagrams, most often on a continuum from abstract to pictorial. And I'm sure that these endeavors have produced some illuminating insights that can move away from the simple dichotomy that we have had of stemma and picture. But I would like to add one observation to this categorizing task, taken from the perspective of my own engagement with rhetoric and its primary goal of persuading a critical audience to have confidence in what they're being asked to believe. I start by asking, why are medieval diagrams so often pictorial? The late antique ones, so far as we know, Cassiodorus, Isidore, were not, recall the horizontal trees, of the liberal arts I showed you earlier. Such diagrams are classified as abstractions by many art historians and are often said to be intended solely for beginning students and presenting just the first few principles of a subject, a sort of catechism of the doctrine to be explored by the more advanced and adept. By this model also, the pictorial diagrams are almost invariably identified as being addressed to children and ignorant laity who need pictures because they can't yet manage logic. But then there's Martianus Capella, who places dramatic ekphrases 
Throughout the narrative of the marriage of philology and Mercury, an epic about science addressed to a highly learned late antique public. Verbal ekphrasis in narrative, what in literature is always called description, is addressed specifically to the task of picturing, but picturing in the mind. Indeed, the Latin translation of the Greek word ekphrasis is descriptio, and it can also be translated as pictura, as the title of Theodolf of Orleans' poem shows. I mean, that's number F on those you have. Um, de septem liberalibus artibus inquedam pictura depictis. This figure in rhetoric is particularly associated with the very desirable persuasive tool of enargea, uh, bringing before the eyes. That vividness in description that Aristotle and Cicero both counted among the very best means of persuasion. I'll have more to say about such picturing on Thursday, but now I want to stress simply its pivotal place in persuasion. A 13th century Florentine rhetoric master named Bene, I don't think that was a, perhaps that was a student uh, comment, I don't know. At any rate, named Bene, uh, defined the goal of rhetorical delivery to be, quote, that the listener may be good-willed, become good-willed, and be led into confident belief by means of persuasion as he becomes warmed through the movements of his animate spirits. Persuasion to the point of confident belief in something involves warming up our humors and desires as well as our intellects, for we must not only be logically convinced, we must also have confidence in our belief sufficient to act on it. And a three-dimensional ramified tree with leaves to examine and fruits to pick and eat, or a tower to be climbed about in, is much more warmly persuasive than a frigid abstract tree schema. Moving illumination, persuasive vividness, enargea was more easily achieved in much of the earlier Middle Ages through narrative rather than through painting, although rhetorically persuasive enargea is also very much a quality of painting. Generally, one need only con consider the portraits of the Italian Cinquecento painters like Veronese and Titian, uh, or indeed late medieval crucifixion scenes. Enargea is related to the Greek word argos, or light. In Latin, Cicero says its equivalents are illuminatio, illumination, and evidentia, our evidence, a compound noun derived from Latin ex and videns, from seeing. But ocular proof, as it is also called, can come through mental seeing as well as actual ocular sighting. And in medieval religious contemplation, mental seeing plays a critical persuasive role. So for example, in the great English 14th century narrative poem, Piers Plowman, the narrator at one point, and this is in Passus 16, begins a visio, an envisioning, a mental seeing, in which he sees a tree called charity. There's a lengthy description of it, somewhat in the manner of Theodolf's poem, though the subject matter is completely different. Various Features are described, dialogue style, with the dreamer asking questions and the tree's keeper, who is Piers Plowman, explaining what its leaves and flowers and fruits are, how it's propped up by three stout staves called the Trinity, against the fierce winds of the world and the flesh, and how the devil always plots to destroy it. Thus far, it seems a pretty static figure. But as Piers names the fruits on the tree, the dreamer asks him if he can taste one. And with that, the tree starts to move and to talk. Piers begins to shake the tree to dislodge its fruits. The fruits cry out as they fall down because the devil, ever alert, collects them up from the ground and takes them off to his hellhole. So Piers grabs one of the staves and tries to hit the thieving devil. This stave is called Phileus. By seizing it, the whole machinery of salvation is then set into motion. Now, such narrative picturing is not for the ignorant nor for children, and it seems to me that the pictorial dia tree diagrams invite precisely such interactive engagement 
from those contemplating them. They raise your questions. Why is this tree painted like this? Why does it branch like this? What, what things does it have? Why does it have things on it? Leaves and fruits, yes, but also often birds and even creatures climbing about inside it. In the words of a recent book about graphic design, a diagram like Langland's Tree of Charity would constitute a, quote, dynamically interactive information design. <laughs> and a highly successful one at that. Those who work in medieval studies are familiar with many examples of just such dynamically interactive designs, painted both in words and in colors, and sometimes carved in stone, too. I'll end with one more example. This is for Lynn Ransom. The great Franciscan theologian and preacher, St. Bonaventure, in about 1260 composed a meditation guide using as its topics the life of Christ, and he called it Lignum Vitae, the tree of life. It soon came to be accompanied by a picture, and here are two interpretations of not that far apart, early, late to the end of the 13th century and the early 14th century. Bon Campagno's text became one of the most popular meditation engines that drove Franciscan sermonizing and that of many learned people, clerics and lay as well. But even so, the text never exactly dictated the diagram. In the painted images, other texts are added to what Bonaventure wrote, figures are added, branches are added, all through the history of this verbally derived lignum vitae. Note that the one from Bury St. Edmunds, that interpretation was painted within 40 years or so of Bonaventure's composition by Brother Martin, a monk of Bury, and not by an outside artist. And perhaps most significantly, it's the only picture in this manuscript. There are no other pictures. How to imagine the textual picture was given great license whenever it was included in the manuscripts. A number of manuscripts don't have a drawing at all, and in others, there's a drawing of the tree without Bonaventure's text. In still others, the drawing precedes the treatise, and in yet others, it follows it. In other words, iconographically, the diagram lignum vitae never was entirely regularized. It was given no authorized design. I think this is because most medieval readers understood the importance of Bonaventure's own characterization of his picture as arbor imaginaria. He wrote, and this is the last uh, G on the uh, uh, set of text. Since imagining aids understanding, I have arranged in the form of an imaginary tree a few things I've collected from among many and have ordered and disposed them, end quote, into a tree shape. He makes this further introductory inter in injunction to his readers, describe igitur in spiritu mentis tue arborem quandam, and so draw a kind of tree in your mind. He says he has brought together a few texts to aid memory, and they need to be located within the tree's branches, leaves, flowers, and fruits. He does not mean that only these few texts are to be memorized, but rather that they are to be treated as the topics for the inventive memory work of meditation. The structure to contain these verbal seats is the imaginary tree. In other words, the lignum vitae picture, whether imagined or painted, is first of all a topical geometry, requiring further contemplation and invention on the part of those using it. Bonaventure offers it as a tool and a machine and not as an elementary catechism to be wrote, learned and examined on. His emphasis, again, is on the process of imagining it, the spiritual and moral efficacy of doing just this. It is not on the accuracy of your own product. In fact, accurate replication in our sense is not something he seems even to have considered. And in fact, since there are no, since, since there is no material painting to accompany this initial work. How could any subsequent painted interpretation of Bonaventure's Arbor Imaginaria to be composed in Spiritu Mentis Tue claim to be an accurate reconstruction of an original artifact? 
Who could judge this and on what grounds? So I'll leave you to ponder that until Thursday, when I will consider several examples of even more complex geometrical envisionings in the work of other medieval writers, including a couple of secular medieval writers, and not only the great 12th century religious contemplatives. Thank you. Mary's very kindly agreed to take questions. Uh, just to remind you that the next lecture is on Thursday, but tomorrow at 12 o'clock there's an open seminar which is here on the sixth floor, starts at noon, uh, and which some of the diagrams I think, you know, uh, Mary would be happy to talk about. So there's the capacity to actually show the images and we'll be able to talk about them in more detail. Exactly, in more detail. So anyone who's, anyone's welcome to come 12 o'clock uh, tomorrow. Um, and so, questions? It's Jerry. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, in the vein of yesterday's perhaps two literal minded ways of trying to three dimensionalize the diagram, yes. I wonder if we could go back to the Hortus Delicial. Okay. Um, and my puzzle there is. There we go. If it is the interior of the dome when it's three dimensionalized, the liberal arts and the texts are upside down. Whereas if it's the bottom half of the hemisphere from the exterior, then the liberal arts are standing up straight and the text is legible. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think about that. But I think it's a very interesting observation. Um, I always understood that circular text there uh, and a diagram more generally as it's true with a lot of medieval diagrams that need to be manipulated. In other words, you can't just simply look at the way that they're depicted on the, on the page itself and say, oh, well, that's it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in some of these books, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure, but probably people in this room would know a lot more about the actual dimensions of the Hortus Deliciarum than I do. But I don't think it's an absolute huge book. I mean, it's sort of folio size. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, so it's folio size, and, and a folio size book can indeed be both literally turned if you've got a group of people. Remember, Hortus is the arm like, um, like Hildegard's books, like uh, <coughs> the Uta Codex, and various other books that were made as meditational books. Uh, for, usually for communities of nuns. These are the ones we've actually lost, of course. But remember, it's a very small community. Uh, these are not things that are going to be copied widely. One of the tragedies, of course, of these books is that they weren't copied until much, much later. We only know about this from uh, 18th and 19th century drawings of it. Um, so that they don't circulate widely. They're within a community. And I think, and I'll talk about this on Thursday, I think they're designed designedly community books. So it's the community looking that's important, and not necessarily only what you take away from them. So that with this, to see it as moving around seems to me to make perfectly good sense. Uh, to imagine it in different directions makes very good sense. Uh, and indeed, another fun I'll pick up on Thursday, to revolve it in your mind might be a very good way of getting to, to, to terms with it. Yeah. Um, this is partly what I mean by these diagrams as inviting us in to work with them.
types of subject matter, I would say no, by and large. In fact, that's one of the reasons I, I brought up the liberal arts here, because it's in many different shapes. I mean, remember that the three basic shapes in Euclidean geometry are square, circle, and triangle. Okay. And of course, imagined as solids, they acquire a third dimension. Uh, they then become, as, as, as they call them, uh, quadratures, rotundities, and triangularities. Um, and as we said yesterday, when the question came up about the map, uh, the map also has to be understood in, as a spherical object. Okay? It's not really flat in that way. And one of the reasons that I brought up the matter of the uh, itinerary and the importance of the temporal dimension in that is that it seems to me that what that does is to introduce even in what looks like a planar um, diagram with only two dimensions, that that critical third dimension, the one that makes it productive, as Marcion Scapello and others have said, the one that makes it productive, that makes it possible for you to move in it, is time. So I don't think that the shapes themselves have the particular content associated with them. Later in the Middle Ages, as you move on into the Renaissance, possibly they do, and you get particularly cosmic diagrams. Um, I have not, I think, seen anything in the later Middle Ages of cosmic diagrams, of, of diagrams with the cosmos that aren't in those concentric circle shapes. But of course, the computer's diagrams of the earlier Middle Ages, many of them are really in the form of grids and graphs. And indeed, the hand, as we have mentioned. Um, I'll talk a bit about that also on Thursday. So I think what's important is, again, it's not so much the subject matter as the way in how you intend to think about it. Because the geometries will give you different um, invitations, I would say, different guidance, perhaps, in how to think about it. But the content can be virtually anything. Hi, thank you again for another wonderful talk. Um, and when I gestured like this for the horses, that's one page, so it's about double time. Um, so it is a large book. Okay. Speaking to that point, I wonder if you could, um, if in your research you've come across anything that talks about um, the communal aspect of this mental process. Um, because a lot of these books are fairly large. Mm -hmm. um, and they do seem to be almost like board games that you would gather around. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I wasn't sure if in the literature and documents you've come across anything that talks about how, how these were shared objects that created discourse versus mental, well, internal mental. Well, I think it's in the, in, it's, I think it's general within the monastic tradition, uh, which after all does emphasize community. Uh, and yes, of course you can go take your book, the book off to your room by yourself and look at it. And maybe you'd even start uh, inventing your colloquy in the in the, the, the six-sided square of your cell in communication with this particular book. But then you go talk to your community about it. And that is over and over. One of the standard ways of, of, of prologue for various uh, uh, monastic contempl contemplative works, treatises on, on the cloister, on the cell, on the monastic life, etc., is the brothers, I'm thinking of you of St. Victor here, the brothers in colloquy, like so much what I was saying about X, that they pressed me to write it down so that we would have a record of this wonderful talk that she had given. That's absolutely standard. Uh, and I think literary historians often just write it off as a simple modesty topos, which of course it is, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. I have a question relating to to growth and in your research you came upon anything linking those two, especially in terms of the tower and the tree. Mm -hmm. The tower in that the, the student starts at the bottom 
um, and would attain, you know, just the margarita you're talking about. Knowledge by, by, yeah, exactly. That, you know, presumably would be much older. Not this one. Not this one. The, yes, this exactly. One. Yeah. But would reach the top, but would be discernibly older. I, yep. You know, it seems that I can't quite tell. Not looking at it close enough, but it seems like at the lower levels, the students are much younger. In, the, in this yeah. picture, that's true. Yeah. Um, but and also in this picture, the students are only in Schoenman Grammar, right? right? I mean, you yeah. don't, you're not, you're not inside a classroom or something. But even yeah. with the tree, you still yeah. have that that image of growth. Yes. With that, that with time comes growth. Yes. Um, have you come upon that in other places, or especially in terms of the human subject versus the image of the tree, the image of the tower? Is this kind no. Of no. <laughs> I think it's just taken for granted. As I said yesterday, remember that the fundamental image of, of thinking, of thought, of constructing a, a thought, is a growth image. Okay? Uh, we have concepts still. We conceive ideas, right? Uh, we, we give birth to new ideas all the time, according to our elders and betters. Um, Etc. Etc. So I'm gonna, this is absolutely fundamental within all of this, it seems to me. Uh, and so when Theodore talks about our burgeoning life, he is really clearly thinking about the life of the student, really in terms of a tree that is grown through time. Yeah. Yes. Exactly, exactly. But it was always a work in progress, and uh, often when people talk of archaeologists, they think of it as a sort of finished encyclopedia, right. like you open uh, uh, and an index and right. all these wonderful things. Right. That was never there, it was never finished. Right, right. No, that's very important. And of course, the other thing that occurred to me about the community is that I think I'm think you're thinking of the right manuscript. Um, isn't the hortus at the end of one of those pictures of the nuns? Right. At the I mean, of the right. current of the current community of nuns is, is the last picture that we have in the hortus. And there's no reason, uh, as Michael has observed, that in if it had gone on being made, there wouldn't have been other pages uh, of the community at a later stage. Uh, so it, these these are wonderfully open ended. We have a hard time now trying to think of books, except in very productive product-oriented as consumer artifacts. These are not. Well, uh, I'm having a lovely time thinking of the synergies between your three-dimensionality of these diagrams and three-dimensional things. So I look at the hair of, um, of the Fortis um, Policiarum and I think of that image you showed, and then I think about the Morgan Chagorium or something like that. Mm. Uh, well, you do have time. You have you have you have the time of law in the lower half, and the time of grace in the top half. Mm -hmm. and you have time in that right? mm -hmm. in a religious context. Mm -hmm. And I, when I think about the uh, heavenly Jerusalem as a folded package of a as a takeaway thing, I think about Suje sitting in his church and thinking that he's neither in heaven nor nor hell, but somewhere in between, in a, yes. in a rather literal way. And I'm yes. and I'm really enjoying this tying up this three dimensionality of the codex and its relationship to the physical things. But I just wonder whether, you know, they, you actually get, you can, you can picture a, a, a philosophical toy, a philosophical tree, a secular tree, as a, as, as a toy that someone would make. Not, not, a, not a theological chivorian, but a, mm. but a, but a real theological statement of the way things relate to each other, the physical thing. Has that ever happened? Can you think of anything like that?
I think I need to know what you mean by physical, if you will. So physical are be three dimensional. So uh, okay. Uh, so any kind of any kind of uh, metalwork, for example, yeah. or sculpture or something like that, would be nice. Yeah, well, it's, that's not that's not narrative, but but actually <coughs> dealing with concepts. I mean, because they do it so so easily with, yeah. in theology. You have yeah. you have um, trees of Jesse's plastered over chapter yeah, houses and sort of thing. Right. Um, right. But what about theological concepts? Um, oh, I'm thinking of say the Sisiji in Anyani or something like that, which is a painted version. Right. But right. it's three dimensional. Really. Yeah. Well, I suppose I suppose it actually Pierce, Pierce Plowman gives it as close as I can think of to a narrative where something moves from I suppose what you might call a narrative dimension, which seems it's not static obviously, but it's a description from the outside of something that is already there and then becomes alive essentially, and the, the narrative then starts to move and the very uh, uh, importantly, the dreamer is caught into that narrative, and but it's but it's imagined again. I'm thinking it's of a physical yeah. thing, but there isn't such a physical. I'm being far too literal. But in a secular context, yeah, or well, or or philosophical. Maybe maybe it's just not. I don't know. I don't know whether anybody made the square of opposition. You'd think that, that uh, the guy who did the doodle <laughs> was thinking somewhat three-dimensional, at least in a lively manner. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking that one way of thinking about it is the interaction between the visual things on the page, let's say the seven liberal arts imagined as seven pillars of a building, and then the seven pillars of a building that are made in response to the notion of seven liberal arts, so that the, the sense of um, the building being supported by this, you know, the, 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 these areas of study that you have to go through in order to get everything else is kind of projected into and kind of encompassed um, in the making of the building. So there's that kind of interaction. Yeah. Um, it's a symbolic interaction, but it's one of the ways in which one can see these uh, uh, surface things, these one dimensional or two dimensional things becoming three dimensional. Yeah, and I can, I mean, with Suje, for example, you have 12, 12 columns and, and they are they are the disciples. I don't know if seven columns would have been called the seven liberal arts, but maybe they did. I don't know. The, the 12 columns, the, the, the round churches, etc. we all know yeah. about that, yeah. Um, so I'm thinking, Jennifer, from your talk, um, and I'm going to ask maybe, uh, I, I hope I'm not usurping the room from on Thursday, but I'm wondering your thoughts about um, Homer Beale's thesis about um, the arc of um, his description of, the, of Richard of St. Victor, Victor's description of the arch, arc of the covenant, having been a diagram for teaching. And he made a very strong argument saying that it was a visual tool used at St. Victor. And it seems to me that that's um, a question that's uh, hiding behind a lot of these questions that you've been asked about whether these objects were made and, and the, the wonderful connection between Bonaventure and the text and then the image kind of suggests this desire to see what is described. And so I was just wondering about your thoughts on that. Well, I will be talking about it at great length okay. on. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, not, not, not directed particularly at Conrad Doodle, with whom I do disagree. <laughs> I wonder if I could ask you about Bonaventura and the sort of persistence of a kind of text that calls out for images but doesn't necessarily have them. Yes. What I was thinking about is Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which Again, as far as I know, he didn't do mm. drawings. Mm. But the very title is such a weird title because it's a radical Protestant who's still imagining an itinerary yes. in Catholic terms, and there's no pilgrimage at all. You think of the one thing you're not going to want if you're a Protestant to <laughs> right. talk about pilgrimage because, right. you know, it's to see Catholic relics. And so you think it would be the worst yeah. thing. But yeah. it's not just the imagination, though. It's very, very much like this notion of what you describe, an itinerary that goes through 
very ex the mm -hmm. set days you have these mm -hmm. places, you know, the Slough of Despond, mm -hmm. and you actually have to make this journey. And it immediately called out for illustration. So people started illustrating it very early with these seats and these places. And you brought that notion of time that's so important for what you've been talking about today, where time comes into the diagrams and you're moving through them. And I was thinking back to something you were talking about before, even when you've got a single uh, image, like the image of, the, of the, the cognitive image, where everything is being interconnected. You've actually got the channels that go between yes. the parts of the brain, so that you've actually got there a kind of pilgrimage, even within the brain itself, is, is everything's in motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, you know, that it's one of the things I was, I was fascinated by also. I, you know, I just, for some reason, never thought about the notion of, of the ladder. You know, you have all of this imagery of the ladder, which is both visual and it goes into the title of, of, of books, the scale yeah. of perfection and things like that. But the notion of the ladder <coughs> itself, again, having that motion involved, that you're actually climbing up, I can climb up the yeah. tower. Yeah, exactly. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the persistence of these kinds of thinking across radically different um, theological formations, radically different um, histories, you know, I mean, it's the kind of thing you to open up so wonderfully all the time, yeah. is the way in which, it's what Roger said at the beginning, that your, 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 your work has been so specifically and concretely about particular periods. At the same time, it's been picked up by people in just about every field and every period. And there's something about, you know, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. About well, I think the notion of topical reasoning is fundamental. Right. It's how people think. And among many people that I, I've contacted, me that I, I have been speaking to uh, fairly regularly over the last decade, are the neuroscientists. And the mental imaging that they do, the MRI scans that they do, bear this out. And in fact, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that the kind of psychology that modern neuroscience is presenting is actually much more like the ancient and medieval pre-modern pre um, psychology than the psychology of the last hundred years. Um, which I think is great, actually. I mean, one of one of, of my, my my great friends, whom I just saw recently, uh, is a an Israeli uh, neuroscientist uh, named Yadin Duday, um, and he first got in touch with me. He came to my office when I was when I was being there. I was very glad to see him, actually. Um, he wasn't complaining. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, he came to see me because he'd been reading Quintilian. Yeah. And he was interested in, in this, at that point, he was particularly interested in this notion that I talked about a bit yesterday, of the need for uh, our percepts, our, 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 our perceived experiences, to, to be consolidated in some form over a very short period of time before they can become a memory that is recoverable. Uh, and that, of course, is a way of locating that memory. And so Quintilian says, in describing, if you know, at great length what the Roman education system was, uh, essentially he describes how much better people, people can remember things after they've slept on them. So that this whole maxim about sleep on it actually goes back into late, late antiquity and now has got some actual scientific, psychological, uh, experimental proof to it. Um, and I, I mean, it, I kid my I kid them sometimes about reinventing the wheel. You have to understand that. But, uh, but, but I'm mostly I am extremely I am absolutely delighted that we've got some scientists at any rate who are willing to take what goes on in the humanities seriously, to look to the humanities to find not explanations but observations, evidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that I think a lot of this is full of. I mean, there's a reason why that education system was in place for how long? Two thousand years. I mean, the, I think the main reason was that it worked. Uh, and uh, I've also been contacted over the years by anthropologists and others uh, who've worked in, in Muslim societies, Hindu societies, where the basic setting down uh, of these sacred texts in topical locations, 
way the Psalms are, as a way of being able to recall them and to work with them. Um, so that's why, you know, I think, I think it's absolutely fundamental to the way that human beings actually think. And I think that's one reason why it, it, you know, it, it uh, uh, reverberates in so many different ways with people. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that whatever his theological reasons might have been, I don't think Bunyan could have not had it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he could have thought about it. Otherwise. We have to get you back here. And now for the last question. So you, you're not thinking about trees, in other words. Is there kind of any kind of history, any sort of history? So is salvational history OK? Um, Beginning to touch on narrative theory, actually. And remember, in Historia, it actually means a story, right? And so that there, there are connections among the events. Uh, and actually, Jeffrey of Vanso, send them off to Jeffrey of Vanso, don't you think you're there? Because there's a whole thing about starting in the middle, remember? And so you interrupt right. this strictly linear uh, flow, um, and you start at the, in, in, in medias race, as it's called. Uh, and then you can do flashbacks, you can flash forward, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, that's a different kind of narrative structure. Um, so I think I do think you, you, at that point you really are thinking about kinds of narrative causations, right? Uh, and whether it always has to be exactly. Um, I hate the word linear to tell you the truth, but whether it has to be. A, 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 a kind of itinerary that goes from one place to another place to another place all the time. But this is the only way to talk about it. That, I think, is not true at all. And I th don't think a lot of historians would have thought that it was true. Because the causation, you can see all kinds of things when you mix it up, which is what that's about. So you, you do the, the, the middle of the story before the ending. Or you start at the end and you go back to the beginning, or you do various sorts of things like that. And when you do that, the causes are not going to be exactly the same. Um, Mary, you, you cited uh, Ailet from um, the Dean of yeah, I did. She has found a map, a, um, a diagram of the Book of Job. Of Job? Of the Book of Job. Yeah. Ah, Ailet, what Ailet collects wonderful yeah. things. Yeah, so that's not that form of historian. Right. And it's actually a diagram. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Just to remind everybody.